So that's all I've got for tonight. It is indeed my great pleasure tonight to welcome Paul Bertarelli tonight. He is a, a pilot, a commercial pilot, I believe, uh, maybe ATP. He'll correct me if I'm wrong. He's a flight instructor. He's a skydiver. But you probably know him best as an author and a, a video writer. He's been doing a lot of great work lately. I've always enjoyed his writing. And it is indeed my very great pleasure to welcome Paul tonight. So thanks, Paul. It's great to see you. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, always my great honor to do these presentations. Uh, allows me to get out at least virtually uh, amongst people flying various car uh, parts of the country. I just returned from a couple of days at Sun and Fun. So we got that behind us and it was good to get out and circulate after a fashion. I can't say I wasn't a little nervous about it, but seemed to have come off uh, so far so good. Um, what we're going to talk about tonight is I'm going to show you the most recent video I did, and <clears throat> this is kind of a uh, broad overview of accidents. And why I did this was, uh, I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. Uh, accident reporting and aviation journalism is a staple. We always, all, all the publications do it in various fashions and have done it for years. And <clears throat> I know I've written hundreds of these things. And um, to a degree, I've, I've come to think there's a certain amount of voyeurism about it. It's kind of like the Russian da uh, dash cam uh, ch channels, you know, you, you, it, it's kind of rubbernecking. I mean, you, you, you read this stuff and you hope to get something out of it. And, and of course we write it with the higher purpose of, of trying to convey lessons to prevent accidents. I don't know if it works or not. There are now whole YouTube uh, channels devoted to this. I've always been interested in the larger picture, which is uh, kind of the broad view of the data from 20,000 feet to see what the trends are, and then to, to, to try to uh, leaven that with some details about specific accidents, because I think there, there is useful information in the data. So when I do these things, um, I use various sources, uh, and TSB is a primary source. Uh, the AOPA null analysis is really very good because they have the resources and the time to do it. And I really use null as my backup for, for what suppositions and conclusions uh, I'm, I might make. Um, it's not granular enough, though. It, it, it doesn't really give you specific examples of the trends that it detects. So I've attempted to do that uh, both in the video and, and my reporting. And this time I tried to treat it uh, with, with graphics. Uh, what's involved in one of these things is uh, it's a lot of work. It's uh, 200 and um, I think it was 45 or 50 accidents. And yeah, you have to read them all. You have to download the report. You have to go through the docket and then and basically read all the details and then sort it into whatever categories you're interested in and in learning about. Um, and I use for this particular uh, study, I use four years, There's no magic about the years. I just picked a couple years early uh, in the 2000s and, and a couple more recent ones because I had complete data. And, I, and I, I wanted to understand the relative risk, and I was interested in engine failures because everybody worries about it. Uh, I worry about it. Uh, and sometimes the more I learn about it, the less I think I know. Um, so I wanted to understand uh, the relative risk. Um, and I'll, I'll transition here to some graphics. Um, if you want to enable me on the screen sharing at that end. There we go. Yeah, you should be. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, let me get my graphics. One thing that uh, I... I wanted to do was uh, relative uh, risk, understanding it and ranking it. So what what this is, is a 
based on these 250 some accidents, these are the proportional risks represented by these various categories. So the big one is loss of control. Uh, and then engine failures are down there. Uh, it's fairly large. It's actually the, the third largest, but there's a little category there, uh, unavoidable engine failures. And uh, unavoidable means that uh, the pilot or a mechanic didn't cause it. And, and we know that uh, more than half, and it could be as much as 60 or 70% of engine failure accidents are caused by someone screwing up. It, uh, it, it, it happens. It, it's, it is a major part of the accident picture. And while I was uh, running the, the week that that video uh, ran, <laughs> this kind of uh, astounded me. This is a poll we ran. And if you look at this, it's, it's really rather alarming. Uh, the question was simple. Have you had an engine failure? About 25 or 2,800 respondents. 20% um, or roughly one in five had one. A little more than one in five had more than one. Uh, about one in five had a partial failure. That would be me. I've had two partial failures. Uh, and only 40% have had none, which if you think about it, is, is, is not especially uh, encouraging. And it, it causes me to uh, wonder about the accuracy of the data, uh, both in the NTSB database and, and the way I sorted through it. Uh, so these are some of the comments. Uh, we got a lot of them. Uh, and if, if, you, if you read these, some of these guys have had a dozen engine failures in, in a career of 30 years or, or 40 years. Uh, I think if I had a dozen engine failures, I'd be taking up bowling. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'd want to stay in the game. Uh, so I provide this as a way of saying uh, it's, it's very hard to to really pin this down with a great deal of confidence. There are certain aspects of it that I'm confident about, but certain not. Um, so what I wanna do here is just play the video. Uh, I, I'm just gonna start it at the four minute mark, or the, uh, yeah, the four minute mark. So it'll be about 20 minutes. And so if you haven't seen it, you'll, you'll, you'll basically, uh, get the gist of it. Now, if someone can remind me about enabling audio at this end. Yeah, you'll probably need to hit that share screen button again, Paul. And when you do that, at the bottom of that box that where you select what you want to share, there's going to be a little checkbox that says uh, share audio. Okay. Um, let's see. And where check the I? box to optimize for video also. Okay. So, and can you also go full screen when you play the video? The other graphics you were showing earlier was really, really small because it was okay. showing up as well. Uh, I'm going to stop share for a second and go back to share and share sound. There it is. Okay, now I remember. Okay, so share, and uh, I will start this to be for reasons I'm sure I don't have to explain. But is an airplane engine actually more reliable than a car engine? It's kind of hard to answer, although, you know, I'm going to try. But we can look at why they quit. First of all, define quit. For my purposes, quit means this. The airplane loses thrust and the flight ends either as an accident or a reportable incident. This is a quit. Or a lot closer to home, this. Or even way closer to home, this. This is our Mooney that ended in a muddy swamp in South Carolina. Engine failures for various reasons initiated all of these accidents. But how often does this happen? Well, it's not quite an everyday thing, but engine failures kill and injure people every year and damage or destroy a lot of airplanes. The good news is that both fatal accidents and overall accidents in aviation have trended downward for the past 10 years, but we seem to have reached a plateau. 
One thing that hasn't changed much is that mechanical issues, stuff that breaks on the airplane, account for about 15% of all accidents every year, but only about 1% of fatal accidents. That's a small number, but not exactly zero either. It's not statistically insignificant. Neither is the fact that of those 15% of accidents caused by mechanical or maintenance problems, more than half, it's about 60%, are the results of power plant problems. If not total failures, then serious enough to cause an accident. That nibbles the risk down some more, but it's still not zero. Also, not all engine failures make it into the database. This one, a Cub engine stoppage a few weeks ago, probably won't make it into the data, nor is it required to. We don't know how many engine failures are never reported. It's certainly some. In the imaginary world I might have lived in when controlled dangerous substances were fashionable, I could crunch numbers and come up with a failure rate based on hours. But the available flight hour data is not very accurate. For this report, I'm relying on NTSB raw accident data, which is itself kind of sketchy. Reports often lack detail, sometimes reach no conclusion, and are probably wrong sometimes. But you play the hand you're dealt. So we'll have to make some estimates. So for this exercise, I'm using 2018. That year, there were 1,224 accidents altogether, with 117 listed as power plant failures, according to the null data. That's a little over two a week. Using the FAA's rough hack on flight hours, real rough, that works out to 0.45 engine accidents per 100,000 flight hours. That's a little more than half the fatal rate, but a tenth of the overall general aviation accident rate. Another way of looking at this is to survey owners and ask them how often their engines quit. NASA did this very kind of survey in 2001 after they posited this stunner. The current reliability of complex GA aircraft systems is unknown. <laughs> no kidding. Lots of data on airline level equipment, but next to nothing on general aviation piston aircraft. So the NASA researchers constructed a statistical model based on an imaginary six hour flight. They use this complicated formula to shuffle things around and they calculated some probabilities, exceedingly low probabilities as it turned out. On this list of stuff that breaks on airplanes, engines rank third of six. Not great maybe, you're flying over the Rockies at night in a snowstorm, but pretty good odds. So why do they quit? What causes engines to just all of a sudden stop? This may be a disturbing surprise, but a third of the time, no one knows. 29% of engine stoppages have no provable cause. The accident report explains what happened, but doesn't say why. There appear to be several reasons for this. The biggest one is that in a lot of accidents, the airplane lands, the investigator shows up, and the engine starts right up and runs just fine, thus dashing the hopes and prayers of the hapless pilot who desperately wanted to be vindicated by a tank cylinder or fractured fuel line. Quite a few of these happened to this airplane, the venerable Cessna 150, whose Continental O200 is famous for suffering carburetor icing. So the airplane lands in a muddy field after the engine quits. The still warm engine melts the ice and like magic, the airplane starts right up. The ice ferry strikes again. More than a few of these have happened with an instructor on board. Forgetting to use the carb heat is a good way to turn a practice emergency landing into a real one. Also, many of these investigations are pretty minimal and that leads to an interesting story about our Mooney here. Recall in this video, I explained that the engine quit on takeoff from an airport in South Carolina and one of my partners landed in an assault marsh. No injuries. The NTSB didn't send an investigator, which is not uncommon for no injury accidents. Instead, the FAA sent a DAR, a designated airworthiness representative. He dragged the airplane out of the swamp, bent the prop straight with a crowbar and started the engine right up. No problem. A couple of months later, after we cashed the six-figure insurance check, the airplane showed up in pieces on eBay. Really? I called the guy who bought it and asked about the engine. Pretty sure he was an A&P. 
Hey, yeah, nice engine, runs great. Shame about your crash. Further research revealed that this wasn't an isolated incident. I found some other accidents, mainly Moonies and Piper Arrows, that used the same Lycoming IO360 with a similar pattern. That made me wonder, why wouldn't the insurance companies investigate these as part of a loss prevention program? Well, they don't, at least not very often. One executive explained it to me this way. If your claim was $100,000, and that's about what ours was, we might spend a third that much trying and not succeed in discovering why the engine quit. So if the insurer is making its quarterly numbers, it's all lost in the wash. It's all about the Benjamins, and that's just the harsh reality of it. Then there's the NTSB. Many of these investigations are too cursory and don't produce the usable data that they should. The safety board is sending its investigators to the FAA's engine school to improve this, but they've got a long way to go. Unknown as a cause in the third of engine accidents is unacceptable in my view. Back to the pie chart here. For my purposes, I'll lump fuel exhaustion, fuel starvation, and fuel contamination into one category, even though these technically aren't engine failures, but they cause engine failures, and they're all preventable. Taken together, these account for the largest known slice of engine failures, and most of those are aviation's favorite stupid pilot trick, running the airplane out of gas. As recently as a decade ago, that used to happen twice a week. But now we're down to less than once a week, so we're getting better. About half the fuel-related engine stoppages are mismanagement, say selecting a tank with only air in it and being surprised when the engine quits. I'd like to say I've never done that. I'd also like to say I'm dating Jennifer Lopez. Both are equally true. One reason for mismanagement is this. It's the fuel valving setup in a mid-1970s twin Cessna. Easy to make a mistake and select the wrong tank. Another reason is panicking after choking the engine and not being able to switch to a tank that has fuel in it before the glide intersects the planetary surface. Fuel contamination accounts for about 5% of engine stoppages. Most of these are undetected water in the tanks. See this video I did last year on this topic and remember to always sump the tanks. Always. Misfueling is part of that 5% too. That's what put this 421 into the grass. It was topped with Jet A. Same advice. Sump the tanks and smell the fuel. If you have doubts, use the method of dumping the suspect fuel onto a paper towel and look for a faint straw-colored stain when the fuel evaporates. That signifies the presence of Jet A. If the fuel is mostly avgas, this method might not work well, however. Carb ice accounts for 6% of all engine stoppages. Some engines are more susceptible than others, mainly Continentals. Lycoming's less so. You know what to do. Engines have carburetor heat for a reason. So use it when the engine is pulled to idle or at low power, and make sure the linkage is in good shape and that it actually works. Sometimes that cable has come loose and isn't connected to anything. Now this is where things get serious. Get rid of all that other stuff, and the two slices of pie left are structural failures and maintenance cause failures. The two are sometimes related. First, structural failures. When a connecting rod blows out the side of the cowling and the windshield is smeared with oil, that's nature's way of telling you you've had an engine failure. Structural failures include broken crankshafts, fractured magnetos, burned or broken valves and camshafts, crumbling rocker arms, cracked cylinders, failed oil pumps, and sundered crankcases, among a list that's not too much longer than that. Thankfully, these are not common but they're not rare either. Numerically, 17% accounts for about a half a dozen a year, but the real number is probably quite a bit higher because not everything is reported. Remember our Mooney. Why do the big parts fail? Well, let's consider crankshafts. In an airplane engine, it's a big, heavy, beefy part that also happens to carry a lot of load. Not that long ago, crankshaft failures seemed to be caused by manufacturing defects. In 2002, Lycoming had a multi-million dollar recall of crankshaft after a series of in-flight failures related to metallurgical issues. 
Continental went through a spate of these too. Crankshafts also fail due to prop strikes that don't get reported and that cause cracks that later fail the shaft. None of these are common, but they do happen. In the typical engine overhaul shop these days, up to a third of all the work done is prop strike inspections, and for some shops it's more like half. Some crankshafts fail because of lubrication failures, either low oil or blocked oil galleries. Camshafts also fail, most commonly due to corrosion or lack of lubrication, which causes spalling. These pop up in the accident reports from time to time. And that yielded this rarity from the NTSB files, an actual runway turnback that didn't work out. It's a Cessna 172 turning back to the runway after a partial engine failure caused by a worn cam. The airplane appears to be in a stall mush, but obviously it didn't spin. It landed hard, and although everyone survived, there were injuries. This is what the cam looked like. This is what a really badly spalled cam looks like. And this is a set of valve lifters that were within hours of failing. Fortunately, these are often caught before an accident happens, either through an oil filter inspection, occasionally oil analysis, or just loss of power. Valves also tank due to poor fitting in guides or substandard materials. A lead nav gas doesn't help this, and no, lead is not a valve lubricant. When rods fail, the engine rather spectacularly comes apart and sheds parts and oil. This often happens because the big end bearings fail due to lack of lubrication. They spin on the crank journal and just come apart. Sometimes these are hard to categorize. For example, I found a few rod bearing failure reports that were caused by under torquing of the bolts when the engine was overhauled. So is that a maintenance or a structure failure? Well, it's both. A noticeable number of failures occurred after the engine had cylinder work done, which, as any owner will tell you, is a routine fact of airplane ownership. What appears to happen in these failures is, well, let's just look at an engine. And for that, I'm at my favorite engine shop, Zephyr Engines in Zephyr Hills, Florida. Let's start with a basic look at an aircraft engine. This happens to be a Continental O200. Small engine, four cylinder, but it's fairly typical of how aircraft engines are built. Two big castings with these heavy duty studs holding the thing, same thing together. Crankshaft goes in here. The cam goes up here. And the cylinders bolt in from each direction. And this is uh, what the connecting rods look like. And as you can see, they're pretty heavy duty. And when an engine is built up, it's done from the crankshaft outward. And because this entire structure is light and highly stressed, all the torque values on these fasteners are critical, especially the rod bolts and case studs. When an engine is partially opened up for cylinder work, those rod bolts sometimes don't get retorqued correctly, especially on Continental engines, and they end up breaking or coming loose. And that is an ugly, really noisy failure. If the case bolts are improperly torqued, the case halves begin to work, leading to fretting, and that can cause the crankshaft bearings to spin in their mounts, resulting in rapid wear and a progressive failure. It's common for the front nose bearing to fail first. This can produce a rough partial failure, not the engine exploding thrill of a thrown rod cap, but the engine will eventually come apart. While we're here, a uh, look at cylinders. Cylinder failures aren't that common, but when they do come apart, it sometimes cracks around the spark plug holes or radial cracks where the cylinder head mates to the barrel or sometimes at the base of the barrel. These also tend to be partial failures since the piston and rod remain attached rather than blowing a hole in the cowling and treating innocent bystanders to an oil shower. Now, which flavor of engine fails more often, Continental or Lycoming? Neither. It's Rotax. Surprised? Well, I was. Let me explain how I arrived at this. We don't have reliable hours flown data, so we can't calculate a rate per flight hour that way. But we do know how many registered engines are in service, so this data represents failures per 1,000 registered engines. A caveat here. This data is based on small numbers, only 13 total accidents over the six-year period we study. So a few accidents can swing the conclusion one way or another. 
I couldn't determine why Rotax is higher than the other two, but it may be small numbers at that. Some of those Rotax accidents were fuel related, but there were mechanical failures in there too. But why do Continental engines appear to have a higher failure rate than Lycoming's? I have a theory. The Continental engine population skews more toward high output, large displacement engines like the IO550 series and the Cirrus I showed you at the beginning of this video. Those engines are more highly stressed and often get midstream cylinder work. This probably makes them more susceptible to failure. Hardly a month goes by when we don't report a spectacular fatal crash on takeoff, leading to the conclusion that engine failures on takeoff are more deadly than in other phases of flight. But is that really true? Let's blow up the pie chart again. According to this accident sweep, failures occur about equally on takeoff and in cruise as a percentage of all engine failure accidents. It's in the mid 30 percentile range. But takeoff represents a smaller portion of the total flight time, so yeah, on a per hour basis, the risk during takeoff is definitely higher. But what about the fatal accident risk? This is where it gets interesting. For both takeoff and cruise engine failures, fatalities occurred in one third of the accidents. So on an occurrence basis, takeoffs are no more deadly than cruise. The eye opener is that an engine failure on takeoff can be deadly for sure, but two thirds of the pilots survive it. Same is true of cruise engine failures, two thirds survive them too. But engine failures and crews ought to be far more survivable because you have more time and more options to find a place to park the airplane. You might bend it a little, but it ought to be survivable. Either way, you should regularly practice both emergency landings out of cruise flight and responding to a power failure immediately after takeoff. I posted a couple of videos on this subject and the links are down in the description. Wrapping it all up, we know this much about engine failures. At least half of them, and probably more than that, are caused by pilots or mechanics doing something wrong or stupid. Out of the blue, no shit, mechanical failures are under 20% of the total engine failures. So that's a small fraction of the 1% of fatal accidents caused by mechanical failures overall. You can reduce it further by doing a few things. And I really shouldn't have to say this, but put enough gas in the airplane. Check the tanks for water, always, never skip it. Put enough oil in the airplane and consider using oil analysis. That might detect a failure trend before it is a failure. Same applies to engine monitors. Modern ones record engine data that can be analyzed for trends. That's how the airlines do it. Know how the fuel plumbing works and how much fuel the tanks actually hold, not what the POH says they hold. Use the carburetor heat when you're supposed to. Don't skip engine maintenance, including mag inspections, and once every couple of months, I like to pull the cows off the airplane and spend 15 minutes inspecting stuff, looking for loose fasteners, chafed hoses, leaks, that sort of thing. I once found an oil filter that hadn't been safety wired and was starting to come unscrewed, and a loose alternator cable. It's worth looking. Otherwise, don't stress too much about an engine failure. On the long list of stuff that will kill you in flying, it's actually pretty far down the list. Thanks to LJ Warren here at Zephyr Engine for letting me paw around the scrap pile. For Abweb, I'm Paul Bertarelli. Thanks for watching. Oh, and uh, by the way, my Mazda quit yesterday. The battery went belly up. Um. During the course of this research, uh, I, I found some um, data that, that I'll actually be using to produce a subsequent video. Uh, and it, it has to do with uh, survivability in these engines outs and, and, and why they go bad. Uh, and I want to show you one. Um, this is a, um, a Cessna 172, uh, a 182, I'm sorry. It had a um, engine seizure failure due to uh, loss of lubrication. And that is a common scenario 
in uh, the engine failures I saw. Um, many of these are caused by um, improper torque on, on case through bolts or rod bolts uh, that translate into loss of lubrication because the bearings displace and the oil can no longer get through the galleries to the bearing and it's a fairly rapid progressive failure. This was a fatal accident and it should not have been. Uh, the pilot picked a good field. Uh, if you look at the other photos in this sequence, it's a big field. He did land across the rows. This is a cotton field. But if you look at the rows, they're not especially uh, deep rows. Uh, and if I were looking at this field for an emergency landing site, I wouldn't necessarily rule out uh, landing across the rows depending on the wind. He did not use fl flaps, which uh, is really a significant mistake. Uh, the, when the airplane touched down, the ground scar is only 78 feet. So if, if he landed without flaps, it's probably too fast to begin with. So 78 feet translates to three to, well, four to five Gs probably, which is itself survivable. However, he did not have his shoulder harness on. And that was probably the cause of the fatal injuries. He, he had uh, a, basically a broken neck. Um, there's another one here. Actually, this is an A36. And um, it crashed not, I won't say shortly after takeoff. It had, it, it, it had basically been flying for several minutes. So it wasn't really a takeoff engine failure. Uh, and it, the site is here. So um, this is in uh, Georgia. And the pilot took this long, lazy turn while the engine was failing. And one of the factors in this accident was that there was a private airport located right here, which is right on the pilot's course, could have easily made it, but it wasn't on the uh, controller's video map. So the controller wasn't able to help him with it. Anyway, he made this 6.3 mile turn after declaring the emergency. And this is all wooded area here. So he, he had other options, but, but he, didn't, uh, he, he didn't use them. And um, so the question now becomes, should a touchdown in this kind of uh, terrain and trees be survivable? I submit that it is, it should be. And, and if you're presented with this kind of a circumstance, you, you don't have a good open field, you don't have any real choices all you can do is slow it up. Make sure you're into the wind if you can figure that out. If you can see a uh, smoke trail or water uh, ripples, or if you've been paying attention to what your GPS ground speed is compared to indicated airspeed. If you land up wind and you slow it up as much as you can, this ought to be survivable. I don't think that's what happened here. We don't really have enough data to know. Um, this is the engine, and this was caused by uh, an improperly torqued cylinder, uh, which caused uh, lubrication lo loss and a progressive failure. And uh, that's, I won't say it's an everyday kind of thing, but it does happen. Also, I found in the accidents, uh, things like this is very typical of those ones where I mentioned that the engine failed because of lack of lubrication. That's what a displaced bearing looks like, 
caused by either lack of lubrication or it led to uh, loss of lubrication. Uh, and then once the bearing starts to shift, it's only going to get worse and it's going to get worse pretty rapidly. So basically those are, are some of my principal findings in this. Uh, I plan to do uh, more research on it um, and you know, we'll see what develops, um, but uh, happy to answer any questions. So I'm just curious, those of you on the meeting here, uh, if you can, if you've ever had an engine failure, either a total or a partial one, uh, go into the participants list and, and hit the yes button. I'm curious about how many of you will see that you've ever had a, either a total or a partial engine failure. We'll let that click up. I'll put it up. I, I've had a partial one uh, one time. Uh, knock on wood. That's all I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've also learned never to tell about what's never happened to me because last time I did that, I was declaring an emergency a few minutes later. <laughs> uh, so we got I personally had, had two partials, both in turbocharged engines, one in the Navajo, one in the Mooney, uh, where the uh, cold side, the, the upper deck hose blew off and the manifold pressure went from 28 inches down to 16, which will get your attention, but it's way better than uh, blowing up the engine. Huh. Yeah, so we got about eight, eight yeses clicked in there and I, I got to figure out oh, there's a hand up as well. Um, it, probably some people can't find the buttons. So it's about a 10th of our people online here have had some form of engine failure. Um, and so I, a couple points I wanted to, to make out though, is you mentioned, you just touched on the idea of an oil analysis as a partial preventive action you could take. And we had that with my airplane. We, we regularly do oil analyses every time we do an oil change. And I sent a sample off one time and a few days later, I got a phone call from the lab. I've never gotten that before. They said, hey, something's going on in your engine. Uh, we got your wear metals are spiking your uh, chrome is going through the roof. They said, why don't you take a look at that? We, su we suggest you pull a lifter and see what happens. So we pulled a lifter and we had a little bit of, of uh, just very light corrosion just beginning on that lifter. So we pulled the next one, it had the same thing. The next one had the same thing. In the end, 10 of the 12 lifters had that going on. And so we picked it up in an oil analysis before it showed in any kind of performance thing or anything else. We caught it in time before there was any damage to the cam and the engine's been solid for the 10 years since then. Uh, I, I see a question there. How can a pilot possibly know that some improper maintenance, especially improper torquing has been done? This is a question for the ages. Uh, <clears throat> you are basically relying on the reputation of the shop. And uh, when I look at some of these uh, accident reports where the engine failure was maintenance caused, they're doing really stupid stuff that they should know better. And a very common mistake is to put sealant on the case halves. And uh, I was uh, talking to LJ at, uh, at uh, Zephyr about this. And I said, you know, even I know not to do that. How, how can an engine overhaul shop not know to do that. I mean, this is almost a guaranteed fatal error because it will cause the cases, it will, it will, it will tank the torque and it will cause the cases to start working and fretting and it goes downhill from there. And I think they do it because they think there's gonna prevent leaks. <laughs> well, it's eventually gonna cause one giant leak. Uh, and then you see, uh, very common for the cylinder work to be done and to remove more than one cylinder and not put torque plates on so that the crankshaft or the rods, mainly the crankshaft, move around and that moves the bearings. And when it gets, when it gets put back together in torque, the bearing is out of place and it starts to shift and eventually spins and there's your failure. And uh, same thing with uh, rods. When a, when a 
rod is removed uh, for cylinder work, uh, especially on Continentals because Continentals have a, uh, a kind of a tricky torque process to get it right. Like Hummings are uh, a, a little easier. Uh, and, and, and in fact, they crop up less in the, in the accidents. Um, can you discuss uh, carb ice at high power settings? I, I can't recall seeing any of those in the accidents, uh, which leads me to believe that it doesn't happen very often. It certainly must happen sometimes, but I, I didn't see many of them. The common, the most common uh, car ice accident is the instructor simulating the emergency uh, landing and, and both the student and the instructor forget to pull the carburetor heat. And, and if it's humid in a, in a 150, <laughs> that is almost guaranteed to cause icing and an engine stoppage. And, and that's uh, pretty common. Um, are there any specific or extra hints during pre-flight, even beyond the checklist, to look for or listen that might tip off a pilot that an engine problem is imminent? Well, uh, that's why I like to pull the, the cow um, every I probably do it uh, four times a year, uh, and I just have a look. I mean, my airplane is, you know, 83 years old, and the engine's newer than that, but uh, I like to have a good look at it, look for loose fasteners, look for any signs of oil leaks, uh, look for anything that just doesn't look right. <laughs> and I do this in any kind of piston engine airplane, a Malibu or 210 or whatever. Pull it down and take a look at it. And uh, if you have a good, reliable, trusted mechanic, have him look at it. Don't don't just depend on the annual to pick up this stuff and you know wait a year uh, be between uncalling. And that many many airplanes that that fly thirty hours a year, that cow doesn't come off between annuals, uh, and the oil is is possibly not changed between annuals. So. <coughs> That's, that's not a good thing. I mean, you really want to be in there uh, looking around. Yeah, and I, I would also add that I, I think having an untrained eye, a regular garden variety pilot, is probably not a bad thing either because you don't know what you're looking at. You, you might be willing to ask questions about something you see that you don't understand or that doesn't quite look right. Are most engine failures older engines? Is there a total time on the engine that seems to fail more often? I didn't... Uh, I didn't do any kind of distribution on time, but yes, new engines fail. I won't say frequently, but um, you know, you look at the Cirrus accident pattern, and number number of those are right out of the factory, uh, and it's uh, it's usually uh, infant mortality related to some kind of a process that wasn't followed, or <coughs> there was one. I'm not sure if that was a factory or an overhaul. The uh, probably an overhaul. They had used a, a paper gasket in place of a, a, a fitting that was supposed to get a fiber gasket. And you think about that, and you think, "Hey, it's a gasket. It's a gasket. I want. I don't want it to leak oil." So, put the wrong gasket in there. The thing puked all the oil out, and uh, it crashed. Uh, and it was fatal. Uh, and sometimes you will see an engine um, fail 10 or 12 hours, and sometimes they go four or 500 hours. And if it's four or 500 hours, well, you know, then you, you, if, if, if it's a maintenance caused issue like torquing or something, well, it made it through 500 hours. So it's, these things really get nebulous on, on what the cause was. A, a friend of mine, and I beat him up to this day about this. He had a, a Cherokee 6, uh, see, it was an 0540 overhaul by some small shop in Florida. And he went to pick it up. And he picked it up at night. Uh, and he was flying it out of the grass strip. And so he... He picked up the engine, uh, airplane. He started up. He did a run-up. He taxied out to the end of the runway and the engine threw a rod 
at the at the end of the runway after he'd done and, and it turned out that uh one of the rods just had not been torqued just hadn't been done so he was lucky uh another if that engine had run another 30 second he 30 seconds he'd had a, a an engine failure night takeoff from a grass strip not a lot of fun <laughs> yeah, I might add that the, the good advice there is never do a test flight in anything other than day VFR. Yeah. Well, when I get the airplane out of annual, I, I again, I uncal it. I inspect it very carefully. I just am, am very uh, nervous about that sort of thing. Uh, do you recommend holding RPM up on the red line on the initial climb until pattern altitude? Um. There is a myth that we used to think that the power uh, that that more engine failures occurred at the first power change after takeoff, but it is a myth. Uh, the the data does not support it. Um, so I guess my answer is uh, no. I, I I would just do whatever the normal climb is and and reduce the power w whenever it's appropriate uh, because the data just doesn't show that the power failures occur at that point. Uh, I do think it's uh, important that you have sorted things out about what you'll do in the event of a power failure after takeoff. When I take off in the Cub, I remind myself every time I take off, that, okay, this time it's no shit really going to quit and I'm going to be ready for it. And, and I, Ready for it is first thing is get the nose down right now, right now. Doesn't matter whether you're going to turn back or go straight or whatever, because if you don't get the nose down right now, you're not in the game. So getting the nose down keeps you in the game. And then I, I have decided usually at a threshold point, if I'm going to turn back, I'm not <clears throat> a big fan of the turn back, but I'm not against it either. I'm completely agnostic on it, uh, but you really have to, Think about it before you take off and maybe have practiced it. I wouldn't mind telling a story here about it. At Oshkosh, sometimes I've been instructing in the uh, Pilot Proficiency Center. And one of the scenarios we have is a series of engine failures after takeoff. And so it might happen on the runway. It might happen just after liftoff. It might happen on the crosswind leg or the base leg or whatever. We do this a series of times, maybe a half a dozen times. And then the last time, we don't let the engine fail at all. And we let them fly a complete circuit and get back down on the pattern. And 99 times out of 100, the comment from the pilot after that maneuver is, I was sitting there waiting for the engine to quit in any second. And I said, exactly. That's what right. you want to be thinking on every right. takeoff. It didn't fail. Wow. Hey, we get to go flying today. You know, I did that scenario there, and uh, I crashed into the same barn twice. <laughs> <laughs> that takes some skill. I hate that simulator. I mean, I just couldn't make it avoid the barn. <laughs> <laughs> the barn was calling you. <laughs> yeah. But I did not attempt to turn back on that. I, I'm straight ahead, thank you. Yeah, on the turn back issue, uh, there's a, been a lot of discussion on it lately. Um, it, there's a lot of great programs. Uh, NAFI's got one. Uh, Brian Schiff has been doing a, a, a bunch of discussions on this lately. Uh, some, some great information out there online. I would really encourage you to just Google the, the impossible turn or the possible turn either way. Yeah, I've been corresponding with Brian. We've been exchanging notes, actually. And that reminds me... Um, the cub that I showed here had an engine failure that was out in Oregon and they contacted me. They said they saw the video and it turned out that, that there was some kind of material, some kind of contamination in the carburetor bowl. And that's what caused it to quit. They weren't able to determine why, but uh, that's what caused it. That's what caused my partial failure. Yeah. That's scary because there's nothing really you can do to detect that unless you take the carburetor bowl off. And I'm not about to do that. Yeah, and I wasn't going to do it in flight, of course, either. And I, I was a, a brand new flight instructor with a brand new pilot in, in the left seat. And in a place, there's no runways. No, It was over Dana Point for you locals. And we it was in a 152. 
and we do all these checks. Okay, the fuel selector, the carb heat, the, the mags, we do the whole checklist, nothing happens. So we're just barely enough power to hang on and maintain altitudes. So we're trying to work our way back, thinking maybe we'll land at El Toro if we can get there. And after a little while, I, I'm going through what could be the issue. And I thought, fuel contamination. I thought, well, is there anything I could do about it? And I said, here, give me the airplane for a minute, my aircraft. So I took the airplane and I just shook the crap out of it. And sure enough, it dislodged whatever was obstructing the fuel in the carburetor and it started to run normally. We got back to full power and made it back to Fullerton. Yeah, good move. That's good airmanship. It was, it was lucky. It was, <laughs> I didn't know any better. <laughs> Yeah, and our airplane, uh, uh, the <laughs> it developed a leak uh, that was leaking fuel, and I thought, uh, you know, it's dripping fuel. What the only thing it could be in an airplane that simple is a uh, stuck carb float, right? Something in the so I took the carburetor off, took it all apart, which involved safety wiring. <clears throat> Turned out that wasn't it; it was the primer was leaking. But I learned how to disassemble a. Uh, a carburetor on that particular airplane. <laughs> hey, Mike, Paul Glessner, uh, if it was a, if it was a turbulent day, you would have never found out you had a, a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you would have been just cruising along. <laughs> Probably true. <laughs> um, question on a, a, a T210M. Uh, bad idea to baby an engine like this and give up the additional altitude. Uh, yeah, you know, he, he, uh, was David Banning's talking about uh, reducing, reducing from 32 inches. Um, I think, you know, that engine is, uh, it'll be happy at 32 inches uh, for as long as you need to get up to altitude. And, and, and my idea of altitude is 3,000 3, feet AGL. At which point, if you have an engine failure, you, you've, you've really got some options. Some yeah, people, I'm, I'm surprised. I've flown with people who will reduce power at like 800 feet. Yeah, so the question say, is, instead of going to the full 36 and a half on the turbo for takeoff, just going to 32, if it's the first takeoff, the engine's not fully hot yet, and, it, and it's light, if I'm the only one in the airplane, which is half of my flights. I feel like just, you know, ramming that thing to 36 and a half when I don't need all that power, or do I? Well, you know what they say about uh, the, the three most useless things in uh, aviation, altitude above you, fuel on the ground and runway behind you. I'll take the altitude every time. Um, I mean, you, 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 you can always get rid of it if you don't need it, but if, if you need it, you're, you're not getting it, so. Um, we used to do that when I was flying Navajos and, and freighting passengers, we used to do a reduced, uh, power takeoff for the same reasoning. And someone who was very experienced with the engine in the airplane said, that's just stupid. So that means that, uh, you know, you have that much less altitude. So if you lose one at 400 feet, you could have been at 600 or whatever. Wouldn't you want to be there as opposed to making it easy on the engine? Yeah. So I stopped doing those. So I don't know. You know, I, I wouldn't do it. I, I mean, I can't, I don't see any, anything in the accidents that I looked at that, that indicate that's a, an undesirable pattern. Um, you added uh, shock heating, shock cooling, and really factors. I don't know, you know, not my area of expertise. I didn't see uh, evidence of any of this in the, in the uh, accident reports. Uh, cylinder failures are fairly far down the list, and most of those are maintenance related. You see a very few that are caused by uh, cracks around the spark plug hole, which could be shock cooling if you believe in it. I, I don't particularly believe in it, but uh, Mike Bush is more expert in that area than I am. Well, does that pretty well cover it, guys? Or? I think so. I know we've got a member online who had an engine failure 
uh, at night. And uh, I, I, uh, yeah, okay, here he's online. He just texted me and said, yeah. So uh, Jay Bruce, you want to tell us your story? If you can unmute yourself. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Uh, um, I, in fact, I was just talking about this story today to some friends. You know, we, us pilots uh, try not to tell the stories. Uh, so, you know, that might really be, uh, be uh, you know, interpreted as catastrophic because it scares people. And But uh, I, I actually... Among friends here. Yeah, <laughs> I actually had uh, on my plane, my engine, uh, it had a... a a camshaft where the uh, where the lobes several couple of lobes had gone flat, and uh, so I, I sent it to to Jay uh, Jay's uh, aircraft uh, to have it uh, overhauled, and and, um, uh, and and so then they did that. But Mike Bush uh, encouraged me to keep the existing cylinders. Uh, you know, it, it, several mechanics told me the same, and and because the the cylinders were running just fine. And, uh, and so the, 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 he wanted me to do an IRAN and uh, have the camshaft uh, replaced. And you know, so the uh, whole engine got redone except for the, uh, for the uh, cylinders. But uh, the c cylinders uh, were the, uh, um, had an AD on them. I think you'd probably know which cylinders I'm talking about. And uh, and I did not feel good about keeping those cylinders because I knew they 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 had a, a history, and so he talked me into to keeping them because they were running just fine. So uh, on my way back from Northern California, I uh, I uh, all of a sudden bam an explosion. I mean it was it was really uh, uh, it shook the, everything was flying just normally and boom it just felt like an explosion. A big strong vibration. Uh, uh, I looked at my JPI real quick, and I can see that my number five cylinder is uh, is is not non-existent. You know, so at least I knew I had some some power. Declared an emergency, and I know we've talked about this subject before. It was my first time declaring an, an emergency. Quite frankly, no big deal. Uh, um, uh, but the coolest thing is that they just really look after you. I, uh, uh, everything you guys talked about, uh, you know, keeping the nose down and, and, uh, and, uh, flying the plane, aviate, navigate, communicate, you know, I mean, all of that kicked in, uh, uh, and, uh, I landed in Madeira, um, you know, I, I, I get out and paramedics are there and all the, uh, you know, fire trucks and police, CHP and all, you know, and, and, uh, and, um, and, uh, so I taxied over to mechanic there, uh, and uh, it was late in the evening, and so they 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 were shutting down, and so they I was able to to close up, and they they, they were able to look at it before they closed up, and and so uh, <clears throat> NK Savvy uh, was uh, available to coach me through what to do, and you know, and uh, but uh, you know to see all the oil off the side and, and everything, uh, you know, I that was that was kind of a that was pretty scary. Uh, yeah, you know, to keep those cylinders, uh, you know, obviously hindsight being 2020, I shouldn't have, have, uh, have kept them. But, but I think that, I mean, there were a lot of lessons learned here. Uh, uh, but one of the coolest things is for me is that be, uh, having this network of pilots and it being late at night and, and uh, uh, you know, I'm not afraid to, to share his name, and I hope you don't mind, Jim. But Jim, uh, you know, got out of bed and, and got in his plane and went to to rescue me, and out in the middle of nowhere. And I tell you what, it, it is an eerie uh, uh, feeling to be out there in a remote site, and uh, and it's dark, it's pitch dark, and and then uh, one of your buddies flies in to 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 rescue you, you know, and. And so we we've got a tight group, and and I know uh, many of you would have done the same. And and so that is, uh, you know, there were many lessons, but that one was will stay with me on on how pilots uh, stick together and and we're able to be an awesome community. Uh, there are a couple other questions here. That uh, uh, question about uh, difference failure rates between 
certified and experimental. I did not sort the data that way, uh, and I don't have uh, I don't I don't have the basic data to determine that, so I can't answer that. And uh, also, uh, incidents of uh, corrosion preventive like cam guard. This did not uh, appear in the accident data in any way. Um, I use it myself because uh, I saw enough cams uh, corroded and spalled, uh, and that's what cam guards decide uh, designed to do is to prevent that. So I use it in the cub. Um, I, I I have tested as very effective corrosion preventative, and it it also has uh, enhanced lubrication additives, so it's pretty good stuff. But no. no no bearing on any of this research. I had an engine failure at night as well. And uh, in my scenario, uh, it had uh, part of the culprit was conflicting checklist procedures between what the airframe manufacturer, which was Cessna, and what the FAA had, had dictated to be changed in an AD. And I was not aware of it. So this goes to the importance of pilots, even if you're not a mechanic, and even if you're a renter pilot to check the ADs. And basically what happened is I was uh, with an instructor and at short final at night, I pulled the power back to idle to execute a forward slip and the engine quit. And I didn't know it quit because I was at idle and engine was low windmilling. And as we we're coming over the fence, uh, the propeller stopped. And I looked at my instructor and asked him, did you do that? Because I've actually had instructors shut the engine off on me uh, before just to see how it would react. And they said, nope. And so uh, we were able to start up with no event. And then later what I found out was Cessna put out an AD in 2001 or so uh, that indicated that seasonally that the lean mixture or the idle mixture needs to be adjusted. And you have to check that as a pilot according to the checklist procedure change by the FAA in which when you do uh, an idle check after a run up, you don't just check that it idles. You've got to check for a specific minimum RPM. And that was on a new revision of a checklist, but I had gotten the latest revision from Cessna thinking I was doing the good thing, getting it from the airframe manufacturer. But it turns out there's a loophole in which it's the owner and operator that's responsible for maintaining the latest checklist uh, per the AD, not, not Cessna. And so what happened was that Cessna had made the change, but then in a subsequent revision, they undid that change in, in complete uh, con uh, conflict with the AD. And I finally spoke to uh, Paul Pendleton, who was the, aeronautical engineer at the ACO in Wichita, and he, his response was, welcome to my world, that apparently the lawyers or whoever got involved and told Cessna to undo the, change the checklist, they're not responsible for it, and so they're in conflict, and so it's up to the owner and, and the operator to actually resolve that conflict and, and, and do what the AD says. And this is something that was completely new, new to me that I was not prepared for. What, uh, what model Cessna was it? It was a brand new 2006 model uh, Cessna 172S NAV3 with the Garmin G1000 Skyhawk SP. Hmm. It's interesting that an, an airplane that new is still having the same issues that we had 40 years ago. It kind of brings to mind to me the thing about if you're used to flying a type of an airplane, uh, with, with, say, a light-coming engine versus the Continental engine. One of them, you need to use your boost pump for takeoff, and one of them you don't. And mm -hmm. if, you, if you turn it on in the one that you're not supposed to, you can cause flooding of the engine during takeoff or landing. Uh, there's also, if you're flying in the mountains with a normally aspirated engine, you don't necessarily want to go to mixture full rich for landing. You, that's too much fuel in the mountains. Right. In a, in a turbocharged engine, you do, but in a normally yeah. aspirated, if you do that, you could cause the engine to quit. So that's right. You have to think about where you are and what you're doing, the conditions you're operating in, uh, and not necessarily go automatically to whatever the checklist says. But think about what's what's going on. Amen. In my case, what bit me was I thought that if I get the latest revision of the checklist from the airframe manufacturer, I should be good, and that was not the case. In fact, the airframe manufacturer reverted to a faulty checklist, which I didn't know and the FAA knew. Mm -hmm. And they were basically in a pissing fight with each other, refused to <laughs> Yeah. Okay, let's see. 
And the last thing I'll chime in, Paul, if it's all righty, you talk about the the bonanza that landed in the trees there versus the, you know, the other airport over there. Some of that gets into your pre-flight planning, especially at an unfamiliar airport. Look and look at what's around. Where where could you possibly go when an engine quits? So you're familiar. If this guy was an itinerant at that airport, he wouldn't even have known that that strip was there, especially if it wasn't charted. Yeah. But we got Google Earth now. That's that's can be a powerful tool. Uh, and if you do land in the trees or somewhere like that, you're right. Absolutely, be slow. Full flaps is a good idea. As slow as you possibly can but not stalled. You want to land under control. Some years ago, I was an accident prevention counselor in Connecticut and the, uh, the guy in the FISTO was named Bob Martins. And we had this discussion because at the time I was doing a lot of research on the survivability of ditching. And I allowed is how uh, ditching was more survivable and landing in the trees. And he said, you know, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, because he'd done a lot of accidents. Connecticut's very heavily wooded, Connecticut, Massachusetts. And uh, a lot of these pilots survived. Um, so one of my things to do was to try to, I've already got the ditching data. I know what the survival rates there are, but uh, I, if, if, I, if I can develop the data, I, I just don't, I can't believe that uh, they would, be the same because ditching you have no possibility of uh, fire and then and trees you, you do a possibility if not a likelihood mm -hmm. um so if i were if i if i had a river or i had a, a stand of trees like pine trees or something i take the river every time even in cold weather I remember Barry Schiff being asked a question one time at a seminar. He was talking about engine failures, and, and the, the question was posed, do you prefer the lake or the swamp? And his answer was, I prefer the road beside the, the swamp. <laughs> yeah. So give me the straight, hard spot. Yeah, if there is a road. Um, if, I, if I may mention, uh, um, I took a water survival course uh, that was being offered in uh, they down in South County, and, and I'll tell you what, that was really eye opening. And uh, the survivability, uh, if you're not prepared in water, I mean, the amount of time that you have in the water is very, very limited, uh, you know, due to hypothermia and all that. And, and uh, uh, you know, you're not prepared, you got clothes on, and, and you know, all this, uh, you know, you're not prepared to open up the, the cabin, and, and, and it is very, very hard to survive. You know, so so I think that uh, I would recommend for everybody to do a, a survive a water survival course. You know, especially being so close here and going to Catalina and all. You know, I mean, it is. It, I would recommend it really highly. And uh, and I'll tell you what, I'm not afraid to say that I wouldn't make it past 15 minutes in that in that water. You know, and yeah. now I know that's that's I know. cold water out there. Yeah. It, it, it just just would not would not survive, you know. Was that the H two O two Foundation one in Dana Point? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, were yep. you there? That, uh, no, but I saw his presentation multiple times when he presented to OCPA SoCal as yeah. well as when he presented at uh, the uh, AOPA summit, which became the Flying Magazine Aviation Expo in Palm Springs. And he actually taught something at that presentation that that, that taught me something. He basically showed a, a, a pulled out a terminal area chart and showed that if you look along the coastline, you'll see asterisks. And that asterisk is basically underwater obstacles. That's why, uh, you know, going back to the uh, ditching that occurred in uh, Florida with the TBM Avenger, I believe, uh, this past weekend, uh, he was able to do that safely because there's no underwater obstacles. But if he had done it out here, like near Dana Point, whatever, there are rocks under the water and that would have ruined his day. So what they're recommending is that uh, he actually then pulled out a NOAA nautical chart and he showed that that actually charts those underwater stuff more accurately. And he re strongly recommended those are flying with water to carry nautical charts with them and or uh, part of the pre-flight briefing, look at where the underwater obstacles are so they know how to avoid them in case they got a ditch and be a little bit di uh, offset from the shoreline. And the nice thing is, is that uh, the, the NOAA has a RNC tile service, the Rashford navigation chart, and you can actually load it in the MB tiles format into four flight and overlay the airspace on top. So you have that as an additional tool in your toolbox uh, if you're flying over water or the coastline. 
I just find the biggest, fanciest cruise ship I can find. I figure I'll splash down right in front of that, and then I'll get a nice meal at the table with the captain, and it'll all be good. <laughs> yeah. But, but Mike and Jim, I mean, that, that would be a great seminar to bring back. I, I would do it again. Was... We had one a, a few years ago, a, a gentleman who ditched a cub mid-channel. Uh, and he, he survived, obviously, to, and came to tell us a story. And if you, were, if you weren't there, we also Dave, had... Uh, D uh, Dave Prizio, I know him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, we also had the, uh, um, uh, the, the rescue team came out. They flew the helicopter in. The, the team that picked him up from the mm -hmm. Coast Guard came in and so they told the story from both sides it was really interesting that night yeah you know i i corresponded with him about that uh, and i i said you know i can't believe you guys fly that route without flotation in the airplane i mean it's one thing to do it without a raft but something else entirely without personal flotation devices because that water is uh it's deadly cold i mean we're talking uh 55 degrees pretty much year round that's a that's a short survival time yep um true in, in my research i found two things uh, there's an egress rate and there's a survival rate the egress rate for uh which is egress is defined as getting out of the airplane successfully is close to 90 percent uh, the survival rate varies by the type of uh water it varies by lake, by river, by uh, inshore or blue water. Blue water is the lowest. Uh, but but inshore and river, it's pretty close to 90% on survival. Hmm. But, I mean, you increase that by carrying the equipment, uh, uh, personal flotation device, raft, signal equipment, whatever it takes. And, and super important to know how that stuff works. Uh, yeah, one of our members uh, doesn't make it off into our meetings because of, of conflicts, but he was in a boat that was motoring to Catalina one night and uh, just all of a sudden they, they hit a wave. And the next thing he knows, he and his two buddies are in the water and the boat is going straight down underneath them. Wow. He happened to have a PLB type radio that he had practiced with. He knew how to use it. He got up one call to the Coast Guard on that. Uh, was able to reach a Coast Guard station in San Diego and get the coordinates, and uh, they were able to get picked up. I mean, uh, it, only because he had the equipment on his life vest, his PFD, he pulled the PFD, he had the radio, the lights, he knew how to operate it, had practiced with it, he was ready with it. And uh, I think Man. the Coast Guard said at the point they rescued him, he was the first live body they'd pulled out of the water in about five years. I wouldn't want to be in that channel crossing that channel at night i mean yeah i'm scared of that stuff <laughs> <laughs> if the big ships don't get you the sharks will <laughs> yeah wow well that's all i've got for you paul okay well thank you very much enjoyed it hope it was useful i think so thanks so much i really appreciate that i'll be in touch in a couple of days with you for some after action uh, stuff here for you, Paul. But uh, okay. again, for the rest of you on board, uh, mark that, uh, what I say, May 18th is going to be our next meeting, probably 6 p.m. again. Uh, and I did have something else I was going to say, but I didn't write it down, so I forgot it. My memory is the shortest part of my body. I can't remember that <laughs> kind of thing. So, Jim, did you have anything else to close us out with? I just once again want to say, hey, Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I know you're on the uh, right coast over there and, and timing's an issue. So I uh, appreciate it staying up late. Um, and by the way, that's a great looking cub. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we, we do have you up past your bedtime now, isn't it? You sure do. <laughs> but uh, usually about 10 o'clock, so half hour. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I hope I hope it was worth your while. I certainly Absolutely. enjoyed it. And I think our I, enjoy, I enjoyed doing it. it. Hope, so, hope you had a, hope it was useful. I think so. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.